about that it is God's will for you to hear his voice. It shouldn't be abnormal. It ought to be the normal Christian life. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And yet, sad to say, that is not the experience of the average Christian. The average Christian struggles and says, how do you ever hear God speak to you? But it, it's normal. And one of the reasons that I think people miss God speaking to them is because they, and I've explained this previously, if you haven't been here, go back and get the teachings and stuff, but it's because they're in the flesh. They are trying to contact God through some physical, natural way. People are always looking for a fleece. They're wanting an audible voice. They're wanting someone to come prophesy to them. And God can and does do all of those things, but that's abnormal. The number one way that God is going to speak to you is that you now have the mind of Christ on the inside of you. 1 Corinthians 2.16 and you know all things. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. You've been renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created you. And that's uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. God's not going to speak to you and say, I think you should do this. But your spirit and Christ's spirit are one. You know, Charlie and Jill sang this tonight about, oh, what a joy it is to be one with the Lord. And 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And the word one there is the Greek word hes, H-E-I-S, and it means a singular one to the exclusion of another. It's not one like this, that we are close together and similar. It's like that we are one. Everything that is true of Jesus is true of your born-again spirit. Your spirit and the born again spirit, the born again spirit and Jesus' spirit are identical. They aren't similar. They are one. You are one with Him. You have His mind on the inside of you. And most people find that hard to believe because they stagger through life just wondering, what should I do? And it's because you are trying to contact Him in the flesh in some physical, natural way. Last night I used 1 Corinthians chapter 2 where it says that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God because they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And most people aren't trying to contact God spiritually. They're trying to contact God emotionally, in a physical way, in the physical realm. And so when God just imparts knowledge to you, you have the mind of Christ. Your spirit doesn't say, I think you ought to do this. Your spirit will say, I think this is what I'm supposed to do. And people miss it because it's coming from them. But it's not your carnal you, it's your born again you. And God speaks to you in the first person, not third person. He doesn't tell you, I want you to go do this. When he spoke to me about starting this school, I desired to start this school. And I talked about this last night. I did remember that one. <laughs> you know, a little bit of explanation. I know some of you think I lost my mind last night when I was telling the same story. But see, I just told that same story on Tuesday night live Bible study uh, just the hour before I came over here, and so I thought that's where, I, anyway. <laughs> it's not like I totally am spaced out. I just, I tell the same stuff so often I forget where I say what. But anyway, last night I know I did talk about that. All of a sudden I just desired to start the Bible school, and that's one of the ways that God speaks to you. Proverbs, or, uh, Psalms chapter 37, verse 4, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean he will give you whatever you want, but it means when you are putting God first and truly uh, loving God more than you love yourself, God puts his desires in your heart. And this is one of the ways that he leads you. And there's mo I would say the average Christian is afraid to follow the desires of their heart because they've been taught that we are so sinful and ungodly Actually, this was said in the church that Jamie and I grew up in. I actually heard this taught when I was a child. And they said, if you want to know what God's will is, you, you take whatever you want to do and do the exact opposite. And that's God. And did you know that's accurate if you are a carnal Christian? Because the Bible says that the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's the opposite of God. So if you aren't seeking God, and if you haven't, 
uh, renewed your mind and things like that, well, then that is a true statement that the carnal mind is against God. But you know what? You can renew your mind and you can delight yourself in the Lord and you can get to a place where you do what you want to do because God has changed your want to. I remember I was over in Germany and I was preaching through an interpreter and this interpreter did not like what I was saying. And so he was struggling with it. I was preaching on the grace of God and he didn't like that at all. And so I was making this point and I said, I commit all the adultery I want to commit. And my next statement was going to be, I don't want to commit adultery because God has changed my heart. But when I said that, he just freaked. <laughs> and he started saying, I don't know, he, he talked for two minutes and finally the pastor had to come have him sit down because he just couldn't handle it. He didn't understand what I was saying. But I'm not saying that I commit adultery and I'm not saying I go out to do this. I'm put God first in my life and God has changed my want to. I don't want to commit adultery. I don't want to sin against God. Amen. I don't want to do those things. God changed my heart. And that's what that verse is talking about. So one of the ways that you can be led by the Spirit of God that's on the inside of you is just what if, first of all, it's a big if. If you delight yourself in the Lord, if you are putting God first, then you can do what you want to do because God will change your want to. You know, I want to bless people. I want to minister to people. I want to go minister to them. I don't have to... You know, people will get up and say, well, God told me to do this and I didn't want to do it. And then they'll talk about how they struggled and for a week or two they just went through agony and finally God just wouldn't leave me alone and so I went ahead and did it. And everybody claps and I think, that's terrible. <laughs> that's terrible. That God Almighty who's got a universe to run and millions of people crying out to Him and He takes the time to speak to you and tell you to do something and then you debate whether or not you're going to do it. That's a sorry testimony. I guess it's better than saying you just totally refuse to do it, but it's just marginally better than that. Man, if you delight yourself in the Lord, once I know what God wants me to do, I'll do it. I'll do it come hell or high water whether it's going to look like it benefits me or not. When you truly have committed yourself to the Lord, you know what? He will put His desires in your heart. So anyway, let me share another thing with you tonight out of Colossians chapter 3. And this is something that the Lord used in the very beginning of my walk with Him. I got born again when I was 8 years old. But when I was 18, I had this encounter with the Lord on March the 23rd, 1968, and it just radically changed my life. And uh, one of the first things that happened, I just fell so in love with God. You talk about God putting His desires in your heart. Prior to that time, I was just, you know, a typical kid up until I was in high school. I didn't have to think about the future because my future was dictated. I had to go through school and so I never thought about it. Then they started talking about career day when I was a senior in high school and I got serious about God, what is your purpose for my life? I knew God had a purpose. I knew it wasn't up to me to just do what I want and ask God to bless it. And so from my senior year all the way through that and then through the first seven months or six months of my uh, college uh, I was staying up until two or three every morning just praying and asking God, God, what is your will for my life? Show me what your will is. And then I had this encounter on March the 23rd, 1968, and when that happened, I was consumed with God, consumed with His love. For four and a half months, I was just gone someplace, caught up in the love of God. And I had a horse that I rode every day of my life. And it was four and a half months later before I thought about that horse. I didn't know if anybody had fed the horse, if it was still alive. I had literally forgotten the horse. I was just consumed with God. And the very first thing that happened was I lost all desire to be in college. I mean, it just, it repulsed me. And prior to that time, I loved it. I just loved it. My mother was gone. She was getting her uh, master's degree in Durant, Oklahoma, and she only came home on the weekends. I was living by myself at home, going to school. I was on my own. I was out 
And I was just having a great time in college. And then the Lord touched me and all of a sudden I wanted nothing to do with college. I was so excited about the Lord. I couldn't think about going and listening to somebody talk about I was a math major and talk about all of this. And I'd go to witnessing to a person. And, the, you know, it'd be time to go to class. And I couldn't let them go to hell because it was time to go to class. So I'd keep talking to them and I'd miss that class. And then by the time I got through leading that person to the Lord, well, uh, the next class was already going. And so I'd find somebody else and I'd talk to them and then it'd be time. And anyway, for two months, I, I went to class every day, but I never made a class. I never made it to class because I was talking to somebody. I'd witness to anything that moved. People had come out of the 7-Eleven with a cigarette pack of cigarettes and I'd say, you're going to hell, repent or else, turn or burn. I didn't have a lot of wisdom, but I had a lot of zeal. And uh, so anyway, after two months of this, uh, I was just going to quit school because what's the point in paying money to go to school if you never go to class? So I just made the statement, I'm going to quit college. And boy, my mother... I did not like that. And I was still living at home, even though she was gone to school and only came home on the weekends. I really honored my mother. My dad died when I was 12, so my mother and I were real close. And when she said, no, you can't quit school. You've got to stay in school. Plus, I was getting $350 a month from the government to pay for my school from my father's Social Security. Uh, he died when I was 12, and so I was getting money for that. And I had a deferment from the draft as long as I stayed in school. So if I quit school, I was going to receive the rejection of my family, and it turned out my church, they uh, voted to kick me out of the church. They threatened to kick me out of the church if I quit school and said God told me to do it. And so I was going to receive the rejection from people. I was going to lose money from the government, and I was possibly going to be drafted. And so anyway, when all of these things happened, I said, well, okay. So uh, I said, I'll stay in. But man, it was terrible. And I think out of, from March the 23rd until school was out at the end of May, I think I made one or two classes because I was be witnessing to people. And I stayed up all night long studying the Word. I actually had two other guys move in with me so that we could stay up and study until four or five every morning. So I was only getting an hour or two sleep. I was so excited about the Lord. And uh, one of the few classes I made, I was so sleepy and I was so bored that I was sitting on the front row and I fell asleep and fell out of my desk <laughs> and landed on the uh, instructor's feet. And he never missed a word. He just kept talking. And I thought, well, he doesn't care. So I just put my head down and I went to sleep. <laughs> so anyway, it was, a, it was a bad experience. And this is, this is what was going on. And I just hated the thought of school because, man, I just had fallen in love with the Lord. And I had no desire to get any kind of a teaching degree. That's what everybody in my family was, was some kind of a school teacher. And so anyway, this was going on. But I would go over and I would meet with people every night and we would study the Word. And one night we were reading in Romans chapter 14 and verse 23. And here's what Romans 14, 23 says. It says, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. This is talking about not eating meat that's been sacrificed unto idols. And really, there's nothing wrong with the meat, but it's the fact that it was dedicated to an idol. And if a person is, has a weak conscience and believes that this is somehow or another partaking of that idol, well, then they're damned if they eat, is what he's saying. So you, you can't violate your conscience. You ought to get my book on who told you you na were naked. It would explain that. So it says, He that uh, doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And I read that with my friends, and I mean, it was just like a dagger went in my heart. And we stayed up usually till at least 2 o'clock, sometimes 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, just studying the Word and praying. We were so excited about all the things we were learning. But this was like 8 o'clock at night. And when I read that, I said... I'm in sin because I believe I'm supposed to be out of school and yet I'm in school because my mother 
told me I had to stay and other people and because I'll lose money from the government and I could be drafted and I'm letting other things control my life instead of what I think God is speaking to me. And I said, I'm in sin. And I said, I'm going home. I said, I'm not going to be in sin tomorrow. I'm going to figure this out what I'm supposed to do. So I left and I went home and I started praying and studying the Word and saying, God, I've got to know for sure. Do you want me to stay in school or do you want me to get out of school? And I, I remember this is just like um, uh, two months or one or two months after I'd had this miraculous encounter with the Lord and I had read the Bible every day of my life since I was a little kid. Uh, so I knew scripture, but it wasn't revelation knowledge. It was all in my head. It wasn't something that was living in me. And so I was really green in the word. I didn't have a lot of understanding of the word, but I was desperate and I made a decision. I'm not going to be in sin tomorrow. I'm going to make a decision. God spoke to me and said that even if I made the wrong decision, but if I made it in faith, he could bless that. But is, if I stay in indecision, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And he told me it's just as bad to be wavering and not make a decision and to be in unbelief as it is to go out and commit adultery. That is, as it is to lie or steal. You've got to do what you have faith to do. And if it's not of faith, it's sin. And so I said, God, I've got to have an answer. And anyway, here in Colossians... Chapter 3, as I was reading that night, this is back in 1968, I was reading and asking God for wisdom on, on this, and in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, it says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. And God just, you know, we were talking last night that you have the mind of Christ and the Bible is nothing but the mind of Christ written down. And when you read it, if your heart is open and if you are asking the Holy Spirit for direction, when you read something that your heart, your spirit man, is trying to tell you, there will be an instant re recognition, a relationship. Like you saw in that video tonight, there was this girl that was a little skeptical and she clicked on it and yet she said that her heart just said yes. Her spirit, the mind of Christ on the inside of her was bearing witness with the words that I was saying. And that's the way it is when you read the word. If your heart is open, God can speak to you through this. And what it is, it's your spirit identifying and it's the same thing that your spirit is saying to you and it's a confirmation. So that's what happened to me that night. I was reading this verse and the Lord just spoke to me. He says, here's your answer right here. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. And I started looking up every one of those verses. I mean, every one of those words in the dictionary. I looked on a reference thing to uh, reference about peace and everything. And when I got to the word umpire, the word, uh, excuse me, the word rule, it is the same word that we get our word umpire from. It literally means you need to let the peace of God be like an umpire in your life. And you know, if you're familiar with sports, like in baseball, when they throw the ball, the umpire doesn't just sit there and look at it and think for a while and say, I'm not sure, play, play it over, throw it over. No, that's not what an umpire does. An umpire has to say, ball or strike but you've got to make a decision and they don't make every decision right but an umpire you just make a decision and it has to be like that and this is what this is saying you need to let the peace of God be an umpire in your life and I used this verse last night Galatians 5, 22 and 23 the fruit of the spirit is love joy, peace, long suffering gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness and temperance every born again person has the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your spirit you always has, have love and some of you think boy I don't I hate this person no in your spirit you always have love you don't have hatred in your spirit if you have hatred if you have fear if you have unbelief you've identified the problem you aren't in the spirit you are in your flesh you are in your emotions in your spirit you've always got love joy and peace always 
this is why when people come to me and say, would you just please pray that God would give me his joy? No, I won't do that because God's already given it to you. You've got it. Well, I don't have any joy. Well, you've identified the problem. You aren't walking in your spirit. You aren't living in the revelation of what God has done. You're going totally by your emotions. And you're wanting your emotions to just change. No, God changed it in the heart and then you have to renew your mind and then the, the peace of God will manifest. But you've always got peace in your heart. And you know, to me, peace is one of the most important fruit of the Holy Spirit because you can imitate uh, love. It's a poor imitation. But this world talks about, oh, I love this man. A man talking about, I love him. This is my, my love. Or a woman talking about another woman. And we perverted it so that homosexuals and things like that will say, but we're in love. It's not love. It's lust. It's not God's kind of love. It didn't come from God because God's love will never function contrary to what he tells you to do. So there is a cheap imitation of love. And there's a lot of people that are into, you know, in the Greek, there's four different words for love. And the word eros is talking about a sexual love. And this is what most people, they, when they talk about that I'm in love with this person, they're in lust with that person. They love them because they're just so beautiful. And to prove it, when they get older and things change, <laughs> like if you were watching this video tonight and seeing me in 2000, I look different than I do today. You know, the man is all buff and he's like Arnold Schwarzenegger and then he gets the Chester drawers disease where his <laughs> chest is done dropped down into his drawers. And the woman married the guy because he's got this long wavy hair and then he loses his hair and all of a sudden they say, well, I'm not in love anymore. You never were in love. You were in lust. As long as it's, you know, satisfying you. But the moment it comes to where they need you, well, all of a sudden, I just don't love them anymore. That's not God's kind of love. Man, God's kind of love can be, it's different than the world, but the world has, has perverted it. And there's people that you can be confused about what love is and joy. There's people that think getting high makes you feel good. That's not God's kind of, you know, that's one of the things that's wrong with dope. They've legalized marijuana here in Colorado, and we've even had some of our Bible college students say, well, I don't believe marijuana is addictive. I don't believe it's a, uh, what do they call it, a gateway drug. I don't believe that that does any damage, which I disagree with every one of those things. But even if you believe that, it would still be wrong just because you are using something else to satisfy you instead of God. You are substituting, you've made an idol. You are leaning on something besides God and that's an ungodly principle. So anyway, people can manufacture things that will take away your depression. You can take a pill that will numb you to a lot of your pain. So love and joy can be counterfeited poorly, I think, if you really understand what true love and true joy is. But there's people confused in that. But you know when it comes to peace... You, I, I, you just can't uh, manufacture peace. It's true. You either have peace or you don't. And the fact is most people, even many, many Christians do not have peace. They're worried about their marriage. They're worried about their kids. They're worried about their uh, income. They're worried about their health. And they just don't have peace. Peace to me is one of the easiest fruits of the Holy Spirit to identify. Because when you are flowing in the, the fruit of the Spirit, peace, it just defies logic. There's a peace that passes understanding. That's good. Jamie and I have been in the midst of situations where in the natural we should have fallen apart like a $2 suitcase. We should have crashed and burned and yet there was just supernatural peace. When they told us that our son died, we had a supernatural peace. And we were able to believe and praise God the Lord raised him up after five hours in a morgue dead. And he's alive and well. He's the one that puts up these screens and controls these screens for us and he's functioning fine. It's a miracle. But we had a supernatural peace. There is a peace that is totally unrelated to circumstances. And that's God's kind of peace. And I tell you, the peace of God, once you've ever experienced it, there's nothing like it. So I say all of this to say 
that you're supposed to let the peace of God rule in your heart, overcome anything else. And when I saw this that night in 1968, the Lord spoke to me and he says, this is your answer right here. And so I began to pray and I said, all right, God, I'm going to let the peace of God rule. I'm going to let whatever I have peace about dictate what my decision is on this. And to be honest with you, I didn't feel total peace in any direction. Because if I quit school, I was possibly going to get drafted and sent to Vietnam. If I quit school, I was going to lose money from the government, which everybody told me that that was stupid and that I'm not taking advantage of the things that were given me. And I was going to be in big time trouble with all of my friends. I had every person, every person except uh, two friends and one relative told me that this is of the devil. You're wrong. You're missing God. And here I was, an 18-year-old, and had just recently had an experience with the Lord, and I was countering people that were 40 and 50 and 60 years old, the pastor of our church and all of these other people that were saying, thus saith the Lord, no, you are not supposed to quit school. So there was a conflict. I didn't feel total peace when I thought about quitting school because of these criticisms. But when I thought about staying in school, I felt zero peace. Zero. I mean, I hated it. I could spend the rest of the night telling you how much I hated the thought of staying in school. And I know some of you think I'm, amp I'm making a bigger deal out of this, but it just, it grieved my born-again spirit for those couple of months to be doing something that I felt I wasn't supposed to do. And I hated it. And I bet you for 20 years after that, I had a dream at least twice a year usually about once every six months. And in this dream, I was back in school. <laughs> and the bell would ring, or it would be time for class, and I couldn't find my locker, and I didn't know what class I was supposed to be in. And I'd wake up in a cold sweat, just like, oh God, what's happening? I'm not supposed to be in school. But I was worried. I had been criticized. People told me, you'll never make it. It's impossible for you to make it if you drop out of school. And it weighed on me. And there's a man in Colorado Springs, uh, Dan Funkhauser. He used to pastor here in Green Mountain Falls. He teaches in our school. And I was in his church. And Dan Funkhauser is a funny guy. You'd have to know him. But anyway, one of the things about Dan is he just doesn't give a rip what anybody thinks. He is one of the most secure guys I've ever seen in my life. When I was an elder in his church, we would go over there for a party and at 9 o'clock he'd come out in his pajamas and he says, I'm going to bed. Turn the lights off when you get through. He didn't care if he had people over at his house. He didn't care. He just didn't care. He didn't care about anything. He, he just... It was different for me. And anyway... The reason I bring that up is to say I had this dream at least once every six months for 20 years. And I never made it to class. It was just always this frustration and I'd wake up in a cold sweat like, God, what's wrong? Why am I dreaming this? And finally, in the last dream, Dan Funkhauser, was, I actually made it to class. And it was my third year class. I don't know why all of this happened, but it was the, my third grade class. I remember and I walked in, and here I was sitting in this little tiny kid's desk. And I was sitting there thinking, what am I doing in here? And I looked over, and Dan Funkhauser was sitting next to me. And I said, what are you doing here? And he says, what are you doing here? Why do you care what people think about you? And he says... You just are worried about what people are going to think. He says, let's get out of here. And I said, okay. And I, So we both got up and walked out. And as I closed the door, I stuck my head back in. And I said, I'll never have this dream again. And I never have. And that was it. And I got set free. But the only reason I say that is to tell you how much I hated school. It was like, if you wanted to torture me, give me a dream that I was back in school. It just... It, I knew it wasn't what God had for me. So anyway, my point is that I didn't feel total peace about quitting school, but when I thought about staying in school, I felt zero peace. And so based on Colossians 3.15, I said, God, I'm going to let the peace of God rule in my heart. 
I'm not certain about it, but if here's, here's what I thought. I just thought, God, if somebody sticks a gun to my head and says, you've got to choose right now, make a choice. And if you choose wrong, I'm going to kill you. I said, if it was life and death like that, and if I make the wrong choice, somebody's going to kill me, which it, in a sense it was, because I could get drafted and sent to Vietnam, and it could have been my death. And I said, if somebody was going to put a gun to my head, and if I made the wrong choice, I've, I've got to choose, but I, if I make the wrong choice, I get killed. I said, I would, if I had to choose under those circumstances, I'd choose to quit school. I said, that's the one I feel the most peace about. And so I made that decision. And I said, Father, that's my decision. I'm letting the peace of God rule in my heart. And even if I make a mistake, I believe you're going to bless it because at least I'm doing it in faith. I'm no longer in sin because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And so I made that commitment. And I went to sleep. And the next morning, I went to the three people who had criticized me the most and had spoken against me. And the reason I did this is because I was new in this. I wasn't absolutely sure. And the Lord uh, told me to test it. He says it's like getting in a boat. Did you know you got a rudder on that boat? But you could spin the rudder 360 degrees. But if you don't move, it won't give any direction to the boat. You got to start moving. You got to take a step in the direction that you think God is leading you. And then if you're wrong, he can move and change and direct you in a different direction. But as long as you are in indecision, God could spin the rudder 360 degrees and it gives no direction to you. And so I said, all right, I'm going to test it out. And I went to my youth director who was there the night that God changed my life. He was the one that was praying and God really used him. And I really respected him. And he had told me, he says, I doubt that you could be a Christian and say that God told you to quit school. And some of you don't understand this, but that's not an exaggeration. That, I was in a highbrow Baptist church where education was everything. If we had a visiting preacher, they came from the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and you would have to sit there with a dictionary to listen to the sermon. They thought that using these words and you know, the more educated you were. And so anyway, education was everything. I'm the first person in my family in generations that didn't graduate from school. So anyway, it was a big deal. And so I went to him and told him, I made my decision. And when I told him, he says, you know what? I think that's God. I was just shocked. I was braced for him to fight me. And instead, he said it was God. And then I went to this lady who was a teacher. She was a school teacher. And she was a personal friend of my mother. And she was an outspoken Christian when I was in high school. And we had become friends. And I told her I was going to quit school. And boy, she erupted on me when I did when I said that thinking that she was defending and helping my mother to keep me in school and she just told me you you are wrong this cannot be God and she had said terrible things to me so I went to Mrs. Ellis the next day and I walked in I said Miss Ellis I made my decision and she said what is it and I told her I was going to quit school and man I was braced for an onslaught and she just looked at me and then she started crying. And she says, I'd give anything to be in your place. And I was just shocked, like, why? And she, she, she I forgot how old she was. You know, when you're 18, a person that's 50 or 60 looks ancient. And I thought she was really, really old then. I don't know how old she was. But anyway, she says, however old she was, she says, I'm this old. And I've never known for sure what God told me to do. She says, I'm just hoping that what I'm doing is pleasing God. And she says, for you to be 18 years old and to have heard from God and to know that God is directing your life, I'd give anything to be in your shoes. And by the time I talked to those three people that day, I was 100% convinced that God led me to quit school. And immediately I got classified 1A. I got sent for my induction physical. I got drafted and sent to Vietnam. And you know what? It didn't look good at the time, but I never doubted it, ever. Because I was letting the peace of God rule in my heart. And you know, in hindsight, that was one of the greatest decisions I've ever made in my life. And to think that it was just one or two months walking with the Lord 
And yet I made one of the most important decisions that ever happened. And when I went to Vietnam, there was hardships and there was a lot of things about it I didn't like. But you know what? I went to Vietnam a Baptist. And just out of desperation, because there was so much ungodliness, I actually stayed in a bunker, a transient bunker for a while, and it was papered with nude pictures of women on the ceiling, the walls. There was so much marijuana and dope in there that people wondered how I kept from getting high just sleeping in there. <laughs> and there was so much ungodliness that the only way I could survive was just to stick my nose in the Bible like this. And I spent 15 hours a day for 13 months reading the Bible studying the Bible. And I mean because of all the new pictures, you couldn't even, you know, read and then put it down and think about it. You just were like this. <laughs> Amen. I was just like this. <laughs> and in hindsight, I went to Vietnam as a Baptist. And when I came out, I went back to my Baptist church that I had been the youth director in and they didn't want me. I'd changed. I was believing stuff that wasn't Baptist doctrine anymore. And I'm not sure that God would have ever have done those things if I would have stayed where I was. Looking back, it was one of the greatest things that ever happened. I came out of Vietnam a thousand times stronger than I went in. And I can see the wisdom of God in it. And it was one of the greatest decisions I ever made in my life. And you know what? I have applied this literally thousands Thousands is not an exaggeration. Thousands of times I have to make decisions. And I believe that God, I am your sheep. I hear your voice. You are speaking to me. So what is it that I need to do? And then I'll look at my options and I'll just pray about it. And then the one that I feel the most peace about, I'll follow it. And that has, I have proven this, that that is the direction of God. I'm telling you, I don't, I don't usually get a prophecy. I don't usually get an audible word. I've never heard the audible voice of God. I don't ask for fleeces because you can be fleeced if you ask for fleeces. Satan can give you circumstances. Man, I could give you some great examples of what I'm talking about. There's times that... Anyway, I'm not going to take the time to do it, but I've had people come prophesy to me that lived hundreds of miles away, had never seen me, and says, and they prophesy to me in a Dairy Queen and say things to me supernatural. It was supernatural. There's no way they could have known it, but it wasn't God. And it nearly cost me my life. I nearly died. But I've learned to let the peace of God. It was not, it says the wisdom that's from God is first of all pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated without partiality and without hypocrisy. James chapter 3, I think it's verse 17. And man, it, it, it wasn't peaceable and I nearly died because of that. But you know what? I just determined to let the peace of God rule in my heart. I've done this hundreds and hundreds, thousands of times and it has worked. This is how I've made decisions that all about Karis Bible College and the things that we do. You can ask the people that work for me. They'll ask me something and I say, well, send me an email about it and let me think about it. What I'm doing, I'm letting the peace of God rule in my heart. I'm sitting here considering what the outcome is. So you sit down and you see, all right, if I make this decision, what's going to happen? If I make this decision, and then you believe that you've got the mind of Christ and in that mind you have love, joy, and peace. And that peace is always going to be there and what you've got to do is just shut down all of the other voices, all of the other people that are telling you what you should do. Shut down. You know, one of the things that really hinders this is people always trying to evaluate what God's will is by how much money they have. Well, God, I don't know. This couldn't be you because how would I afford that? Forget that stuff. God didn't tell you you have to pay for it. You just have to believe for it. But see, we limit God and, and you've got to get rid of all of that. You've got to get your mind focused on the Lord. Get to where you are delighting yourself in the Lord and then look at your options and whichever one gives you the most peace is what you go with. And let me put this um, parenthetical phrase or underscore this point. If you all of a sudden are having problems in your marriage and you say, God, should I stay married or should I get a divorce? 
and you don't have any peace about staying married, but man, you think this would be awesome to get rid of this person and get another one. I'm going to let the peace of God rule in my heart. That doesn't line up with the Word of God. The Word of God says, Malachi 2.15, God hates divorce. He doesn't hate divorcees. He hates divorce. There may be some occasions when divorce is a better option than murder. I'm not saying that there's never a time that you can't divorce under certain circumstances, but 99% of the time, if you are just wanting to get away and think of the prop, if I could just get away from this person, everything would be okay. And then you go into the next relationship and you have the same problems and you wonder, what's the deal? The only uh, common denominator in those two relationships is you. It may not be the other person who was a problem. It was you, the way you're responding to the other person. Anyway, you always have to check things by the Word of God. If I was trying to make a decision and I felt peace about going out and robbing a bank, I'd look at that and see, does this match up with the Word of God? No, it does not. Would I go out and lie to gain some advantage? No, it's only the devil. He's the father of all lies. He's the one who instigates it. But I sit there and even, maybe it's not a lie, maybe it's just not telling the whole truth. The Bible says you shall not bear false witness in Exodus chapter 20. It's one of the Ten Commandments. You always check anything that you think is the leadership of the born-again spirit, the mind of Christ, with the written mind of Christ. And if there is a difference here, it, you always let this trump any feeling or any uh, discernment that you have. And so this, this means that if you don't know the Word of God, you're going to have a really hard time hearing the voice of God. If you're young and don't know the Lord, you need to be under somebody who is mature. And not just somebody who's been a Christian for 30 or 40 years, because there's a lot of carnal, old Christians. You need to have a spiritually mature person. You need to sit under and bounce some things off and check it out. I am not saying that you just take the first thought that comes to you and whatever you feel like doing, do. No, you have to delight yourself in the Lord. And if you'd be honest, you know whether God's first in your life or not. I can tell you, when I was in, um, I think I was in Childress, Texas. It's somewhere around 75 or 76. It was about five to seven years after I'd had this encounter with the Lord. The first time that it just dawned on me that I am seeking God with my whole heart. And I might have been seeking God with my whole heart before that, but that's the first time that I knew that I was seeking God with my whole heart. You know whether you are. If you'd be honest, you know whether God's first in your life. And if God is not first place in your life, well, first of all, make Him first place. But if for whatever reason you aren't going to do that, well, then forget everything I said last night and tonight about, you know, uh, God giving you the desires of your heart and letting the peace of God rule in your heart. If you're, if you're not sincere, if you're a hypocrite, this isn't going to work. But I'm assuming that, that you really love God and if you are sincere seeking God, it doesn't have to mean you're perfect, but it means that you are seeking God with all of your heart. And if you're serious, He'll put His desires in your heart and He will guide you by peace. And if you don't have peace, don't do it. Amen? That's really simple. And there's a few times that I've violated that and nearly every time I've paid for it. Matter of fact, we had a situation come up within the last year that there was a person that moved up in our ministry and I even told him, I said, look, I don't have anything against you, but I just don't know you. I'm not confident with you. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I was actually talking to Billy and him at the same time and I said, I have 100% confidence in Paul Milligan because I've had a relationship with him for 30-something years. And he's proven himself to me, and so I trust him. And I said, Billy, I don't know you as long as I've known Paul, but I said, man, I have a great relationship with you, and I trust you nearly as much as Paul. And then I told this other person, I said, I don't have a thing against you, but I just don't know you. I don't trust you any further than I'd throw you. Some people think, well, you, you said that? Yeah, I didn't mean anything bad, but I was just telling him, I don't know you. Amen? And so anyway, 
he worked his way up through the ministry and nearly cost me my ministry and had to leave and, and stuff. And I shouldn't have even allowed the other people to put him in that position because I didn't feel peace about it. But I didn't have any reason. I didn't have any knowledge about anything. But it turned out I should have just let the peace of God rule in my heart. There's a few times that I violate this, but very few. And the older I get, the less I care about what somebody else says. I'm just going to do what I feel peace about. And if I'm wrong, God will bless me more for being in faith than he would for me to sit there and just follow the advice or what circumstances dictate and yet I don't feel right about it in my heart. I just do not violate the peace of God that's in my heart as much as I can. That's, that's one of the ways that I hear the voice of God. So anyway, I'm sharing this with you to say that this is, this is how simple it is. People make it complicated. It's not complicated. You have the mind of Christ. You know what Jesus knows. You know everything that He knows. But it's in your spirit and it has to be spiritually discerned. How do you do that? The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. God's Word will unlock this. Psalms 37, 4, Colossians 3, 15. They will unlock this mind of Christ and you can start receiving direction. And if you do that, I guarantee you to transform your life. And let me make this application. And again, I know that some people will think that I'm manipulating or I'm saying this for selfish reasons, but I believe that this is true for a lot of people in here. And so I'm going to obey God and I don't care what you think. But there are many of you that have a desire to come to Karis Bible College. You've thought about it. And you have a desire. But you let what other people say, you let your circumstances, you're worrying about, well, what will I do for a, a living? We had a person one time say, I live under a bridge. How can I come to school? I said, we got bridges out here. I said, come out here and live under a bridge. I had two, one person say, I got two dogs. And I won't tell you what I said because I always get in trouble. But you can have dogs out here, amen. It's just amazing. that they, And I've had people say, "If look, if I could just do what I want to do, I, it's in my heart. I really believe that I, I want to come to Bible college, but I'm just not sure it's God. Do you think that the devil would put it on your heart to come to Bible college for two years or three years and sit under the Word? Is this the devil? Is it your flesh? Has your flesh ever made you want to sit and study the Word for four hours a day, five days a week? The point I'm making is there's many of you that if you didn't think about what somebody else had to say about your kids, your grandkids, your dogs, Selling your house. What am I going to do? For, if, you, if you could just forget that stuff and say, God, what are you speaking to me? Many of you desire to be here. Many of you have peace about it. But you got all of these other things and you're letting it stop you from doing what the peace of God is leading you to do. And I'm telling you, you're missing God. Now there's some of you that know that God's got something else for you and that's fine. If God doesn't want you here, we don't want you here. You'd be a problem. <laughs> but I'm telling you, there's many of you that you have the desire and you have peace. You would just love to be here, but you're letting other things hinder you. I was talking to a couple here tonight about something and, and one of the things they were talking about was family and how that they've got responsibilities, kids, grandkids and stuff and what's going to happen. And you know, one of the things I think about often is Abraham. He was told to leave his father's house and his country and go out to a land that God would later show him. And he only partially obeyed God. He brought his nephew with him because his brother had died and his nephew was fatherless. And I'm sure that Abraham thought that, you know what, I've got a responsibility to a family member and I need to help him. And probably every person in here would say, well, that's a good thing. That's a, that's a great thing to be concerned about your nephew. So he brought Lot with him. But look what happened to Lot. Lot wound up living in Sodom 
and God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, his wife looked around and turned into a pillar of salt. He had at least two daughters. It says he went to his daughters, plural, in Sodom and tried to talk them into leaving with him and they mocked him and said there was no way. So he lost at least two daughters plus son-in-laws and possibly grandkids and two of his daughters came out of Sodom with him and they actually wound up committing sodomy and having children by incest. Let me ask you how it could have been any worse for Lot if Abraham would have just obeyed God and left his kindred and have not brought Lot with him. When you start trying to take what God is telling you to do and say, well, God, I'll do it, but I, I'm going to do it this way. And you start adding to it, you always mess stuff up. I'm telling you, if God is telling you to do something, do it if it hair lips ever devil in hell. Just do it. Well, boy, if I do that, what's going to happen to my retirement? Who gives a rip? Well, I'm only two years away from retirement. Well, excuse God. He didn't know that when he told you to come. He's just not as sharp as you are. Man, if you'd stop and think about it, man, once God puts something on your heart, just do it. Do it regardless of what the consequences are. If you can prove to me that God tells me to do something, I'll do it if it means my own death. And somebody said, well, yeah, it's easy to say. Well, I did it. 51 years ago, I quit school and got sent to Vietnam and I nearly got killed twice in one day and I faced death many times and I was willing to do that because of what God told me to do. You can't tell me that, well, you're just blowing smoke. I'm telling you, I've done it. And I'd do it again. And God has never failed me. God has never disappointed me. God is faithful to the max. I'm telling you that if God is telling you to do something, you ought to do it. And somebody says, well, man, how do I do it? When do I do it? It's like I was saying, you got to start moving in some direction. And, you know, if you start doing something, the Spirit of God on the inside of you, the peace will either amplify the more you get closer to what God is telling you to do, or it'll diminish. And so you just, you just make a decision, head in that direction. If you aren't sure, you know, give it some time and just make some decisions. Head in that direction and either you will gain confidence or you will think, nope, this isn't the right time or the right place. And you can make an adjustment. But God could spin the rudder 360 degrees and if you're doing nothing, it's not going to give you any direction. You've got to make a decision. You've got to do something. Amen? Amen? If it was me, and if I had any direct, any idea that God was leading me to come to Bible college, you know what I'd do? I'd, I'd put down registration. Because that's a step. Amen. 